Right, watch this. Oh. Cold that, isn't it? Oh. What do ice baths, January in the UK, and sweat all have in common? They're all horrible? Mm, not quite. They all keep us cool. I know a lot of us do brand ourselves as fair weather runners. I certainly do. But can the cold actually help with our running? Is cold the remedy you need to be faster at running? And can heading out in the winter months make you a better runner? Well, stay tuned as we reveal the answer to can the cold make you a better runner? But first, don't forget to hit subscribe and tap on that bell icon so you get notified when we upload new videos all about running. And now, freeze! And comment down below if you think the cold will help your running or not. Now let's get frosty. Let's kick off with the cold being used in recovery. Cold therapy is increasingly popular among sports and exercise. In fact, ice baths have become increasingly popular over the years too. Anna and I have actually had to endure these in a running channel video. Can you remember which one? Let us know in the comments below if you can. And here's a reminder of what it was like. So why is this awful invention so popular? Well, some reports suggest that the freezing water minimises fatigue and speeds up recovery between sessions. It does this by reducing muscle and tissue inflammation. This sounds perfect. Endure a bit of pain in the ice bath, but then you can recover faster and get back to training quicker. Win-win, right? Mm, not so fast because <laughs> there's an increasing amount of scepticism around the benefits of ice baths on athletes in the long term. In the same way cold water immersion may blunt resistance signalling pathways following a single exercise session, reducing inflammation, it may reduce the effects of key long-term resistance training adaptations such as strength and muscle mass. So if you're looking to get the maximum benefit from your hard training, it may be best to avoid the ice. Okay, well ultimately it's a trade-off then between potentially recovering faster to go harder again soon. For example, if you're between races which are close together or maybe reducing how effective your training is if you're in a key training phase. Sticking with exposure to the cold, cold body therapy has also become popular in recent years. There are lots of different cold body therapies out there, ranging from simply taking a freezing cold shower every morning to more extreme and expensive options like whole body cryotherapy. Cryotherapy involves standing in a sealed chamber for a short bit of time whilst extremely cold air is circulated around the body. This therapy in particular has been popular amongst professional athletes and lots of celebrities too. There's also the Wim Hof method. If you're not familiar with it, it combines breathing and cold therapies and is used by people to help connect with their bodies and improve physical performance. Now it is slightly controversial and some of the exercises are quite extreme with reports of fainting and various disclaimers about pre-existing health conditions. So do be careful and as ever, get proper medical advice before trying it. We're using the Wim Hof method here as a more extreme example, but lots of people have used elements of this method, such as cold water swimming, to help with lots of different things like mental health and well-being, and even chronic pain. So what does cold therapy do? Well, the purported benefits from cold therapies link to reduced stress, increased metabolism, and tackling inflammation. Some people cite faster recovery, a stronger immune system, and increased energy, but there are also potential non-sporting benefits from it, like reducing stress, improving sleep, and enhancing creativity. There are varying degrees of truth and science behind the claims, but lots of people anecdotally say that they turn to cold therapies like open water swimming and even taking a cold shower in the morning to help with their overall mental health and well-being. Psychological benefits can be just as beneficial as physical ones, and this ties into a reason why a lot of people run for their mental health and well-being. So the cold could not only help with running recovery, but also on a wider level in relation to headspace and well-being. 
Now there's obviously a big difference in winter temperatures around the world. In the UK, getting down to minus 10 is a pretty big deal, whereas in the likes of Canada and other parts of the world, a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius isn't unheard of and can even be the average. If you're going to be running in cold temperatures, then make sure you have adequate kit to be able to deal with the colds. Base layers, gloves, hats, and appropriate footwear for if it's icy are a must. What happens when you run in the cold? When you run in cold weather, your heart rate and your body's dehydration levels are lower than in warmer conditions. Research done at St Mary's University in London found that lower temperatures can also reduce stress on the body. So how and why does this affect your running? Well, you might think that exercising in the cold would burn more calories because you need to keep warm. Now, whilst it's true that energy is required to keep you warm, and if you stayed still in the cold, you would burn more calories than if you sat still in the warm, it's not so simple when running, as the exercise itself keeps you warm. In fact, it's likely that exercising in the cold can actually be more efficient. On hot days, we sweat to cool down and can become dehydrated more easily. Widening of capillaries increases blood flow to the skin to lose more heat to the environment. But these processes require a lot of energy, energy that isn't needed anywhere near as much when training in cold weather. So there's one tick for the cold weather. But this doesn't mean you can forget about fueling and hydration in the colder months. You still need to make sure you're hydrated and have enough energy to get your run done. We've got videos all about hydration and fueling on the running channel, so go and check them out for more info. Another way we lose energy is through an increased heart rate. The higher your heart rate, the more energy is burned. So this is why high intensity sessions like intervals or hill sprints use more energy than an easy paced recovery run. Heat and heart rate often go hand in hand. The hotter the temperature, the hotter you will be, and so the harder your body has to work to cool you down, meaning your heart rate will be higher as your body increases blood flow to the skin to help cool you down. So in colder conditions, you'll often find that your heart rate is lower. If it's temperature rather than purely effort that's impacting your heart rate, be careful if you're using heart rate zones to guide your training. Don't strain too hard to get your heart rate up on a threshold run, for example. Try to run to feel. One recent study found that heart rate was 6% higher in hotter conditions amongst the athletes they tested. This will vary for each individual, but is a good indicator of how big a difference temperature can have on your body. This is a good factor to consider if you're training for a race abroad, what would the temperature difference be and is it worth travelling there a bit earlier to give your body a chance to adapt to the difference in climate? Now, do cold conditions have the same effect whether I'm running 100 metres or 100 miles? Well actually, no. A study conducted in 1999 showed that the sprint strength produced by eight male runners in 30 degree heat was more than the strength produced in 19 degrees. So sprinters may benefit from a warmer environment due to the increased muscle flexibility over a short period of time, but the same benefits cannot be applied to long distance as the heat will become a detrimental factor over time, causing an increase in heart rate and sweating. There's also an optimum temperature range for running a marathon if you want the best performance. A recent study looked at over a thousand races and found it to be when the air temperature was between 10 and 17 degrees Celsius. Another factor whilst training in cold weather is making sure you're adequately warmed up before starting out. No, the first mile is not the warm up. It can take your body four to six weeks to properly adapt to running in cold conditions. By running straight out of the door without warming up properly, you are putting yourself at risk of injury. Cold temperatures restrict blood flow, meaning your muscles feel a lot tighter and you can be at a higher risk of a pull or tear. In order to avoid this, it's best to warm up with some dynamic stretches, such as leg swings, banded crab walks, or lunges. Check out our You Need to Do This Before Every Run video for more warm-up tips. It's also sensible to change your types of training. The faster you try to run, the riskier it is. If you have asthma, the cold is also going to be a factor. The colder the temperature, the more likely you're going to experience asthma symptoms like coughing and wheezing during or after exercise. This is because cold and dry air can irritate sensitive airways. Even runners who don't have asthma might find their chest gets tight and they cough after hard efforts in the cold. 
If you have asthma and the cold weather is affecting your running, try covering your mouth and nose with a buff or scarf when you run to warm up the air you're breathing. Alternatively, you may need to exercise indoors or consider doing less vigorous exercise outdoors, like power walking, for example. So can the cold make you a better runner? Well, actually, I think the jury's out on this one. There are definitely some benefits to the cold. But it's not always going to lead to success and actually can sometimes hinder your performance. So basically, don't ditch everything and run to the North Pole, but equally start to think about the cold as a factor in your training. If you live somewhere with a dramatic change in climate throughout the year, then the change in temperature will have an effect and it's something to consider with your training. Yeah, and equally, if you're like a triathlete, for example, who loves a cold water swim, just consider how this is going to affect your muscles and adjust your training to help avoid risk of injury. I'm just actually really glad that we got to the end of this one without any of us having to take in another ice bath. Well, yeah, not so fast, Rick. Didn't you hear about the video ending? What? Oh, well, I thought you volunteered to do another one. Oh no, not again. <laughs> If you want to see Rick take on another ice bath, then just click like and make sure you comment below Rick Ice Bath Round 2. If we get more than 100 comments, we'll make it happen. No. no. <laughs>